So our second speaker this afternoon is Keith Chandler. Keith's a, a practicing equine vet and um, his affiliation today is Beaver. Um, Keith was president of Beaver in 2012 and also the pet plan uh, vet of the year in 2012. So congratulations for that. And you're going to talk to us about the role of passports. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak this afternoon on, on horse passports. Um, clearly, this takes up a lot of energy at the British Equine Vet Association. It's something that we, uh, um, our members have to work with horse passports every single day, and sometimes, more often than not, we have to work every single day without the benefit of access to horse owners' passports too. Um, there's just a bit of background on Beaver. Um, some of you may or may not be aware that um, Beaver is really an is an organisation, an association that um, has a large membership right across the whole world. But one of the things that sets Beaver apart a little bit from the other uh, vet, uh, professional associations within the veterinary, veterinary profession is that we're probably a greater part of the industry that we work in, i.e. the horse industry, than we are within the, uh, within the veterinary profession. Um, we're, as, we're as much an integral part of the um, horse industry as um, commercial organisations such as the BHA or uh, the charitable sector such as the BHS or World Horse Welfare than we are as part of the veterinary profession. Um, we're a pretty innovative organisation too. We, um, we not only have a large um, CPD programme that we organise annually each year, including a really successful uh, congress in September each year with nearly 2,000 people attending over three or four days, uh, but we have a, lot, a number of um, um, online products, including smartphone applications and such like, which are all free to, to members. So uh, that's the plug over. Um, um, so the horse passport system. Uh, why, why do we have a horse passport system? Well, it started in uh, 2005. Uh, it took up a lot of uh, time, uh, veterinary practices, equine veterinary practices across the country, um, doing horse passports for horses for the first time in, the, in that year or two that followed the introduction of the horse passport system. Um, and the horses sit in a slightly unique way because they are very much companion animals and they're sports animals, but they're also um, um, classed as a food animal. And the reason that we have a horse passport system is so that there is a permanent record of whether that animal can and should enter the food chain. And, also, and if it is going to enter the food chain, then a permanent record that goes along with the horse at all times of what medicines the horse has had during its life and, and of course, the subsequent withdrawal times for those medicines or, uh, indeed, some medicines uh, the animals can't enter the food chain at all. And if those have been used in, in the horse, then obviously the horse has to be signed out the, of the food chain. But as we all know, there's no good welfare for these animals unless they have uh, access to the treatment uh, for disease, which means that without access to medicines, then um, the animal's welfare is likely to be compromised. So the horse meat industry is not going, to, going away, and I'm going to come back to this, but the, the, the horse meat is, a very, is an inexpensive and popular meat across Europe. And, and, and I guess any sort of informed and sensible person within the horse industry would have to accept that as long as horses are, or anim, all animals are reared, transported and killed humanely, this should present few problems to anyone who is a professional horse owner. And, and, there, and there have been um, growing calls for um, horse meat to become accepted as part of just what happens to horses through their lives. And I was at a meeting recently uh, organised by World Horse Welfare in Scotland uh, just last month, and it was interesting, I think 10 years ago, in a similar sort of uh, grouping of horse owners, people would have been horrified to think of horses as being, as being eaten and being um, part of a, a meat industry. But during that meeting last month, it was interesting to hear horse owners talking openly about um, there not being enough horse abattoirs in the UK. And so, uh, so it, was a, it was a really interesting discussion. I think things are changing in terms of the horse owners and the public's perception of where the horse sits within, um, within society. So horse passports should stay with the horse at all times. Um, there should be a, a record of the medicines that the horses have, and they should have this um, so-called Section 9, which is the part of the passport where, where there's a declaration that's made by the owner of the horse at some stage during its life whether the horse is going to enter the food chain or not. Um, that's quite important because if the horse is going to enter the food chain or if the passport isn't signed, we have to assume it's going to the food chain. It does restrict the medicines that the vet, the horse vet can then use for the treatment of disease in that, in that particular horse. Um, what the horse passport is not, is not a proof of ownership. 
um, it stays with the horse, but it doesn't actually it doesn't tell us in the horse in the, within the document who actually owns the horse. We also have no idea where the hor where the horse is kept or where it's been. Um, and it isn't just a vaccination record. I think there's a kind of misconception within the some some parts of uh, horse, some horse owners that you know it's just a, it's it's just a, a record of who owns the horse and what vaccinations the horse has had during its during its life. Albeit the vaccination history can be very important. Um, so I'm going to run through a lot of faults that there, is, there are with the horse passport system. And I mean, there are some really good things about the horse passport system. And, I, I, and it might seem that I'm going to dwell on all the faults, and, and, and perhaps I am. But the, I guess the, the horse industry is a funny sort of industry. It's, it's, it's um, you know, it probably never had faith in the horse passport system in the first place. It, and, it, and, it, and it certainly, what faith I did have in the horse passport industry is it, probably faded somewhat. And, I'm, and here I'm not talking about the really professional end of the horse industry. I'm not talking about the racing industry, which takes these things really, really seriously and always has done. I'm talking about the, um, perhaps the, the, the less professional aspects of the, of the industry. I mean, there's a million horses in the UK, and, and only a small portion of them would be regarded as, as, as competing uh, professionally or being used in a professional manner like that. Um, the horse industry is, is, very, very, is run by very sceptical people, you know what I mean? They, they, they regard the horse passport system as an unnecessary bureaucracy, as it says there, but they probably regard the horse passport very much as the same way as they regard a horse health and safety, for example. You know, it's just a load of bloody nonsense, you know I mean? They, they don't really regard it as something that's really important to the, to the, to the, to the whole success of the industry. But in any case, it, it's... It's, it's quite easy to get, re re relatively easy to get duplicate horse passports. It's relatively easy to falsify these documents. And of course, that all leads it to, to being that it makes it very open to fraud and then re and resulting welfare problems thereafter. Um, the, these are some common faults that are discussed. They're not necessarily the views of Beva, but there, there, there are, I think, nearly 80 horse passport issuing organizations within the UK. Um, some of these passport issuing organizations are perhaps less good than they should be. Some of them are run from people's back rooms in their house. Um, there's no national equine database, so we've got no um, database that we can log on to find out the, uh, whether the microchip number of a certain horse matches its unique life number, where that horse has, has lived and where, what medicines it's had, uh, where it currently lives, who the current owner is, who was the owner last year, and what medicines the horse has had. We've got no, in, no national database at all like that. There's very little enforcement of the horse passport um, legislation. Um, there's widespread ignorance, um, sometimes deliberate ignorance within the industry. And there's a lot of multinational movement of horses, which makes it difficult to track horses down. There's one thing having a national equine database, but when horses move between the different countries in Europe quite freely, and in and out of the UK, and from Ireland to the UK, and then from the UK to France, and elsewhere, it's really difficult to track um, some horses down and to know where they are at any one time. Um, and you can see there are some uh, different passports here. Some of them, these aren't uh, um, just some of the passports. We'll show some, uh, I'll show you some better ones in a, wee, in a wee while. But you can see these passports, you know, relatively easy could be pulled apart, photocopied, tipexed out. And I'm sure that anyone who's working in horse practice here will have seen all, exam all kinds of examples of horse passports being uh, tampered with to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, some of these so passports issued by Shetland Pony Society, Clydesdale Horse Society, um, Irish Horse Register, Pet ID, and I don't know what that one is, the Coloured Horse and Pony Society or something. You know, there's 101 different types of organisations that issue passports. And all of these passports are just vary ever so slightly in, their, in the way they're laid out, which just adds time when you're dealing with the horse passports on a day-to-day -day basis, having to flick through them to find whether the identification matches the horse, where the microchip number might be. Um, some horses have multiple passports, some, has, some horses still have no passport, and uh, some passports in a foreign language. Um, some horses have no microchip. Some horses have more than one microchip, would you believe? Um, and, there, and as I said before, some of, many of these passports are, are not tamper-proof. And again, there's a widespread misunderstanding of the importance of Section 9 in terms of signing the horse in or out of the food chain. So why is the horse passport system coming into the spotlight now? Well, you won't, you'll all remember the horse meat crisis that happened last year. Um, and this was um, all to do with uh, food fraud and criminality. And when one um, went, gets an understanding of how horse meat ended up in, in um, p 
products that were labelled as beef is just it's, it's absolutely horrendous, and it's just it's really hard to believe how how much criminality there was involved in that in that in, in that whole um, um, crisis last year. But this did present the horse industry with a unique opportunity to restart and reboot. Um, the horse passport system, the horse identification and traceability controls that there are of, of horses. And as I've already mentioned, horses are, vets are faced with a restriction on how they should treat patients. If, there's no horse, if, there are no, if there is no horse passport there, we are restricted in how we uh, medicate horses. There are additional um, recommendations in terms of what forms need to be completed if there's no horse passport present. And um, um, the other thing is, is if there other potential welfare problems are, if the, you know, if horses don't have passports or if the horses are untraceable, you know, it makes it more difficult to match horses up that are perhaps fly grazed to their owners. It's more difficult to track down stolen horses. More difficult to track down the owners of horses that are that are suffering and, and are subject to uh, welfare investigations. And so, um, the other thing is, with I think. Without a robust horse meat sector, there's, there, there's little outlet for horses which have low value or those of which have got little chance of a future in equestrian support. In equestrian support. Um, so horses are all of a value. You know, some horses have very little value, some horses have very high value. But the, the thing that helps, one of the things that helps support the horse industry is having an outlet for horses of low value. So horses that maybe have got poor confirmation that are really not going to have a future within the industry as sports horses or horses that, are, that have maybe come to the end of their useful working life. Some horses come to the end of their useful working life at five or six years old. Some of them don't reach that point until they're, until they're very, very old. Um, and so there's, it's good to have an outlet for those animals in terms of having a future within the horse, within the horse, meat, in, um, within the horse meat sector. Um, signing horses permanently out of the food chain makes it difficult for those horses then to re-enter the food chain while well, it's possible. They're not supposed to re-enter the food chain at all unless they have a new passport put on, which does happen from time to time. Um, and obviously, with no national equine database, it is difficult to trace animals in an outbreak of exotic disease or an outbreak of infectious disease, resulting in unnecessary, dis unnecessary delays in the, in the um, closing down of those outbreaks of disease. So there are some real and present dangers in having a, a horse passport system that isn't fit for purpose in a new national equine database. Um, so this is an example of a, a, of a really good passport. This is a Weatherby's passport. You can see that it's, uh, the way it's put together, there's, there's uh, some of the pages that are embossed, they're very thick. It's very uh, much more difficult to take apart, although I'm sure a committed person could do that, take it apart and put it back together again and, and falsify it. But it does make it much more difficult when the passports are put together in this really substantive way. Um, but the horse passport does have many benefits. Just having a legal document that goes along with the horse does encourage the horse owner to be responsible. And, it, and it, so it, having those documents present with the horse, if the, if, the, if the horse owner takes it seriously, then it, it does go a long way to ensuring that horse owners do comply with the legislation. So some solutions to this. I'm just going to run through a few, a few solutions to the potential solutions to the um, uh, horse passport um, system not functioning as well as it should do. I should say, not all of these um, solutions are necessarily beaver policy. They're just ideas that we've had over the years. And, and, and a lot of the things that are happening just now with the review of the horse passport system, um, and some of these ideas are being taken forward and, and some aren't. But one of, the, one of the real key things that would really help the horse industry a great deal is having a robust national equine database. A database. That's a national equine database that would be up to date, real, real time up to date, using the technology that's available right now to ensure you know, that you can get real-time access to current information on that horse's status and whether or not it will be ent entering or not entering the food chain. We've seen examples already this afternoon of the technology being used within the poultry sector to, to the great benefit of, of, of poultry welfare. And this, is, this would be something that would be a real benefit to uh, vets in practice and to the horses they treat. And there is already technology available for microchip scanners to uh, Bluetooth the, uh, the, the microchip numbers to smartphone applications, and then those smartphone applications to access the internet to track down the horse's name and, where it, and, and, uh, and whether or not it should or shouldn't be in the, in the food chain. Um, another novel approach would be if, if a vet is faced with a horse that they're of, un of unknown origin and whether or not it could, uh, sorry, it, it, we may or may not be entering the food chain is to um, is to implant an, a microchip in, a, in a, an, unusual, an unusual site, or not the site that's normally used for the implementation, implantation of a microchip, but putting a microchip in that's, um, that marks that horse as being 
um, um, a non, a non um, our horse is not going to enter the food chain. Some more solutions. Just a kind of more widespread acceptance of the horse as a food source. And I think that's gradually happening, but I think if we, as, a, as an industry, more readily accepted the fact that horses were a food source, I think it might just sh um, sharpen people's minds a little bit on how they manage their horses throughout their lives. Um, making the person who um, sent the horse to the slaughterhouse, being the person who's um, responsible for the residues within that carcass would be a good step forward too and I believe that's something that is being taken seriously is that so the consigner is responsible for the residues in that carcass. We do need to have improved enforcement of the legislation and some other ideas would include limitations on the pack size of veterinary medicines and the limitation uh, limitations on the online pharmacy sales of medicines for non-food producing animals. Um, this is a problem whereby a uh, large packets of medicines such as phenobutazone and, and other medicines that are in, in a similar sort of vein um, are, are dispensed in large quantities, often for, say, geriatric horses or geriatric patients who need long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication and pain relief for a, long, a good part of their life. There could be restrictions on the uh, pack size of those medicines to enable um, um, horse owners not to be self-prescribing or prescribing to each other medications from the cupboards in their, in their livery yards. Um, so again, a robust horse passport system, which is enforced with clear guidance for all, documents which are tamper-proof, although albeit the, any additional um, admin burden may attract greater costs to the industry, either through um, additional costs on medicine supplies or, or in professional fees. So just to, just to conclude and to uh, finish up, the, it, a, a, an improved horse passport system will substantially benefit equine welfare for all the reasons that I've outlined this afternoon, but it, but it does need a few things. It needs a, it needs a national equine database, I think, all within the horse industry um, recognise that, that uh, having a, a national equine database that's, perhaps, that's up to date and available in, with real-time access is, is an essential part of improving the, 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 the way in which we manage our horses in the UK. Enforcement is a big part of it. Um, having, having penalties in place for people who breach those regulations. Um, a culture shift within the, within the equine industry, a culture shift within the equine industry in, in terms of um, not just accepting horse meat as a food source, but a culture shift in terms of taking the, 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 uh, the horse passport system um, seriously and making it a really important part of how horses are managed day to day. And I think that is gradually changing. I think things minds were focused last year during the horse meat crisis. It certainly uh, pushed a lot of our members, veterinary surgeons working in equine practice, to you know, check and double check horse passports in the horses that they are treating. But there needs to be a culture sh shift within horse owners in to, to accept that the, that the horse passport was a, is a really serious thing and a really serious document that has to go along with the horse at all times. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. A quick run through. Thank you. Thank you. Have we got questions? One over here. Hello, um, Adele Williams from BVA Overseas Group and University of Surrey. Um, I was just wondering, with respect to the compulsory microchipping of horses and the passport system, um, is there going to be any compulsory reporting of death of an animal once it's passed away and return of the passport? So um, it's, it's currently the case that, um, it, as I understand it, it's, it's, um, it's a requirement for when a horse passes away for the horse passport to be returned to the passport issuing organisation from which it came. However, there's, there's widespread ignorance of that part of the legislation. Most horse owners do not send their horse passports back to the PIO when the horse dies. So what was happening before with the National Equine Database was that there was plenty of foals being registered as being um, on the National Equine Database, but there were very few animals dying, according to the National Equine Database, because animals just seem to live forever. So the owners were not returning the passports to the PIO. Um, and there is, I was speaking to Keith Meldrum this morning, an ex-CVO, and he was saying that the, the current feeling is that, is that the horse passport should, be, should accompany the carcass when that carcass is rendered. You know, and that's just going to add another comp, com, complexity to the whole horse, pas, horse passport, um, the management of that system. You know? um, but it's, again, it comes back to 
horse owners, and I'm kind of, I'm not really picking on horse owners, I'm kind of, I think there's a lot of people here who represent the more professional end of the horse industry, and that's happening in their end of the industry. It's just everybody else, you know, is not taking it seriously. These horse passports should be going back to the PIO when the animals die or when they're euthanized. Um, and we certainly tell our owners that, but many of the owners just don't do that. They like to keep a memento of the horse's life. You know, they want to keep something, whether it be a cut of the horse's mane on the, part, the passport and it goes in a drawer and is forgotten about. Thank you. Anna Harrison from the Donkey Sanctuary. Um, I perceive this to be a massive welfare problem. If Section 9 is not filled in, then it's condemning an equine to a life without painkillers. It puts a vet in an impossible position. Uh, would money better be directed at establishing a withdrawal period for Butte? Yeah, I, think, I think that's a really good idea. I, 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 guess, I guess the problem is there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no safe minimum um, limit of butte in horse meat that makes it safe for humans to ingest, and there's always going to be a theoretical risk. And you see Peter Jones in the office, and, and, and Peter might be able to um, um, add some more to this. But the, you know, there, there is a very, um, there's no known safe limit for butte. But yeah, I guess it would be good to. Um, know what the, the withdrawal time for butte is in, 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 in horses such that it could be used. But we've got to remember that not every horse will need painkillers in its life and not every donkey will need painkillers in its life. It's only a proportion of them that will need painkillers. And there are already licensed medications available that provide pain relief that do have um, MRLs, you know, that do have uh, withdrawal times. So butte isn't the only painkiller that's out there, albeit it's the cheapest. However, if there was a for example, if we were to lose Butte tomorrow and Butte was no longer available, then the other products would step in to, and, and fill its place. Um, and those, although those medicines are more expensive at the moment, they wouldn't stay very expensive for very long. Their price would come down. Those medicines, for example, like Meloxicam, are already, is, is already a genetic medication. So although it's not licensed for long-term use, it does have, a, it does have an MRL and... It, um, and I think the price would come down further if butte was no longer available. So one solution to counter what you said would be just to not use butte ever again and just stop, just stop, uh, prevent, prevent it from being uh, dispensed. Of course, I don't think you'd ever get that past the establishment. There's one in the middle here. Can we go to the gentleman in the middle here, please? Thank you. Andrew Scott, uh, past president and chairman of BVA, of AWF. Um, a question that interests me is when I was going through the BVA executive, Keith Baker and I went down to Italy to look at a, a tag being developed by identity tag being developed by Benetton and Texas Instruments. And this was about the size of half a little fingernail. It could be rolled up or could be put in flat. But the great feature of it was it's possible the first side would contain all the identity details of the animal or other product because it was obviously they were pushing this over a huge range of project products. But you could add a further three sides of A4 of information onto that tag during, well, at any time scale. So in other words, we were interested from the animal point of view in that you could add medical records, um, all sorts of uh, uh, information to that tag. So not only would it identify the animal, but the veterinarian involved could add the sort of information you're talking about. Now, I haven't heard any more about it, and I've long since uh, gone from BVA executive, but I wondered whether you have heard of any similar developments or whether that looks to be a way forward. It's, it's certainly very interesting, and it, and it would be, it'd be a lovely to have an, a, a, a an ability to add medical records, if you like, to, to an implant like that. I guess what's probably happening is because there are now so many horses that are already microchipped, the solution is probably going to be access to real-time information within the cloud based on the horse's microchip number, its unique microchip number. I guess that's probably what's going to happen. It's, it's interesting. I mean, we've only been microchipping horses for a very short while, and it's only been compulsory 
since 1999, I think, that we've been... So there's a lot of horses out there that have got no microchip. And one of the things that Beaver would be really, really keen on is having retrospective mic microchipping so that all horses were microchipped, all horses were identifiable by a, a unique number so that they could, all be, um, and they could all be tracked down by that microchip number. However, I guess it all comes back to all very well having a microchip number or any other form of identification, but you still need to have a way of finding out the information on that animal from the microchip number. And that comes back to having a, a robust and accessible national equine database. We've now got a series of questions, so we're going to work down this side. So we start at the top and then go to the middle and then to the bottom. Thanks, Keith. Sheila Vos, CVO Scotland. You've mentioned a few times the need for a robust equine database. Um, I'm intrigued as to what information you think it should hold to meet all the purposes suggested for welfare and location and disease control and how you would make sure it was kept up to date. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's, that's a really big question. Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, it depends who you ask in the horse industry, because I think some people would, would want to have that horse's granny and granddad and its great granny and granddad's records and everything else on it, and all the jumps it's ever managed to do and every competition it's ever taken part in, how many rosettes it's had. And, and interestingly, there are there are people out there developing. Um, there's a developing a, a, some people developing a smartphone app right now that will be able to record all that information and have an ability to you know match it up with the. Um, the horse's microchip number and then transfer it from owner to owner going forward. But, in, but it's a really good question, Sheila. I think what would be ideal, what would be ideal is just a, is, a, is the animal's current owner and where, it, where it's staying as well as whether it's going to be, um, 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 whether the ch it's going to be entering the food chain or not entering the food chain. And if it is entering the food chain, what medicines it's had. But that would be, that would be great. Of course, the difficulty is, is that when you start adding potentially very confidential information to a platform like that and um, then it could um, then there's a, there's a chance it could be hacked you know and there, and you know and, and in situations where horses are involved in very um, elaborate and high-end sport then that and that and if that sort of information can therefore be accessed by uh, people who um, um, maybe maybe be on the wrong side of the law, for example, might use that information to bet against a horse, for example, in a, in a particular situation. So you've got to be careful about the amount of information that becomes publicly available. You know, for example, if there was medicines recorded as having recently administered to a horse, then that is likely to suggest the horse is under treatment for a disease so, or a disorder such that, you know, maybe it affects its ability to win a race, for example. So you've got to be a little bit careful about the amount of information that would go on to that that would be publicly available. Um, but there has, there are the, the basic information that I think that would be there is the horse's, the horse's name, um, you know, perhaps where it was bred and who owns it at the moment, where it's kept, and also what, um, whether it's in or out of the food chain. Thank you. Catherine. Catherine McLaughlin from the National Farmers Union. Um, I'm coming away from my comfort zone and commenting on horses this time. Um, in the NFU, a couple of, about 18 months ago, we developed a policy on fly grazing because it's becoming more and more of an issue for NFU members. And it just strikes me that whilst this is a, it's been a really interesting talk, and thank you very much, I think it all does, it could all come, come crashing up against a wall, because ultimately we've got thousands of horses that belong to the travellers and, the, and the, the gypsy fraternity. I'm assuming there's none in this room. Um, you know, that there is no enforcement. We don't know who owns them. You know, there's a black market trade there. They get dumped in various hedgerows in farmers' fields, all the rest, and we'll never actually be able to control that side of it. So whilst it all comes down to kind of, you know, we're doing, we're trying to do this, we're trying to encourage that, until we can actually get to grips with, with that illegal side of the market, then it could actually put all of this um, under absolute jeopardy, really. Yeah, I mean, flag raising is a big issue. I mean, I have to say I'm not as up to date with flag raising as perhaps I should be because we, we don't really have it north of the border. Um, but the, as I understand it, the best solution to flag raising, of course, would be for, you know, if, if animals are, if animals, horses by the roadside or horses that are flag raised are, are seized, that someone has to prove that they own that animal, otherwise it's destroyed. That would, pro that would sort it out fairly quickly. I think at the moment that's not necessarily happening. But perhaps some of my other colleagues in Beaver might be able to answer your question over coffee later on. Sorry. Uh, Paul Roger, Sheep Veterinary Society. I'm also outside my comfort zone. Um, but I just wonder, who would actually pay for the uh, national database uh, if it's going to be in the hands of the industry? 
then it seems to me that there are also some public goods that come from having that, that information on a database. And, and how would that be managed? Would you look for funding from government as well? This has to be funded by the horse industry. For anyone to suggest otherwise, they're just, you know, not on this planet. It has to be. The, the horse industry can well afford this, despite what they might tell you. And it, could be, and it could be something as simple as having a levy on every new passport that's, that's produced. You, know, you, you, might be able to, you might be able to finance the whole thing from um, you know, a £10 levy on every new passport that's produced. You know? I mean, that, and that in itself enters the pot and it manages the National Equine Database. And I know that's been suggested, but there's, there's absolutely no question. Perhaps some seed funding from government to get the whole thing going, but this should be managed and financed by the industry. Um. Ben Mays, uh, Equine Vet in Sussex and Federation of European Equine Veterinary Associations Vice President. Um, interesting, the European Commission had an equine experts meeting last week and um, it was quite interesting. The, there was supposed to be a vote on the passport regulations replacement this week and luckily that's been postponed until after the European elections. And with the incoming European Commissioner, they certainly seem to be open to suggestions as to how to proceed with the horse meat industry and with the um, passport um, issues. Um, this country is quite interesting in that we're one of only two countries out of the 28 that have multiple PIOs, i.e. over 10 passport issuing organizations, and that was our own fault. Um, and really, the, we, Beaver have to lead the industry into what we want and how we want it and have got to sing it from the rooftops. If we want one PIO, we've got to stand up and be counted. Um, and we've got to really, we've got a few months now before the next year European Commissioner comes in to really shout what we want. I'm asking you, Keith of Beaver, to lead the industry in that. Thanks, mate. Okay. <coughs> Thanks, um, Emma May on AWF trustee. Um, that was a really good talk, and it's lovely to hear someone be so refreshingly honest about how much money there might be in the horse industry, so thanks for that. Um, I just wondered whether you should actually just say the passport should be expensive. Um, everyone talks about responsible pet ownership and the number of people who take on horses at low cost who then can't afford the ongoing care of such a large animal. And if you put a high value, make the passport a few hundred pounds, three or four hundred pounds, you could easily fund the database. And it would immediately place a lot of worth on that document that makes people want to hold on to it and make sure that it stays with the horse and it's something worth having. Um, and it also would engender that thing, that immediate thing, that if someone's going to buy a horse, there's an immediate cost associated with it um, that might just trigger a few bells for people who might not be able to afford ongoing care. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Thank you very much for that. I mean, you, some, those of you who don't have horses might not realise, we you know, that our local, local farrier charges us about £80 every six weeks to put shoes in the horse. £80 every six weeks, you know. It's, not, it's, it's, it's nothing compared to the, sorry, the, the cost of a horse passport that our practice charges is about £40, you know, for the production and, you know, full, the, the, the full passport to be delivered to the owner's house by recorded delivery is about £40. You think, well... You probably got a good point there. Really, if you add, the, if you make the horse passport a good, de good deal more expensive, it might the horse owners may take it more seriously. Keith Rayleigh, Rayleigh from Welt Horse Welfare. Thanks very much for your presentation. I guess part of the problem is calling it a horse passport system because it's clearly not because that implies travel, and while horses do travel, it's an equine identification system that's gone so badly wrong and. Uh, you've rightly pointed out that enforcement is part of the solution to um, it, having a, uh, an effective um, equine identification system. Um, and I, was, I suppose I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was shocked at a Westminster uh, um, meeting a while back where an MP quite openly told me that he thought the um, equine horse passport system, in his words, were, were useless and he didn't comply with it. So, I mean, if we have our politicians openly saying they're not going to do it, then there's little hope for the uh, average horse owner out there. But I, I wonder... Uh, you say there's got to be this sea change in the equine sector to make it work. Now, obviously, vets form a significant part of that sector. Um, what more do you think, what additional responsibility would vets be happy to take on to make the system work? I don't think there's any need to take on any additional responsibility. I think that we as a we as, a, as a vets need to just take our own responsibilities that we have at the moment 
um, a bit more seriously and perhaps lay down the law. Vets, vets are very um, averse to uh, being the law enforcers. They don't want to be the ones that, um, you know, try and, uh, you know, make the clients comply with legislation. We're not, I don't think there's anyone really wants to try and do that within the, within the, um, within the, within the veterinary profession. I'd like to think that our, that our members, Viva members, are pretty well informed about this. Like we couldn't try any harder to inform our members about their, their um, requirements under the existing horse, horse identification, horse passport legislation. I mean, I think there was a, there was a spell there where our, we send out a weekly newsletter by email to our members, two and a half thousand or so um, emails go out every Friday. And I think there was a period where about for, every, for about six weeks, every single week, there was a bit in it about the horse passport system and how we should be you know, doing it properly. And I think on the most part, most of our members are probably complying with the rules fairly well. Of course, you know, it's not just people, if you're working in pure equine practice and all you're doing every single day is horses and you know your clients really well and you've got a, your own practice management software back at your clinic that records whether the horse is in or out of the food chain and you've got the animal's microchip number and their unique life number in included in your practice management software and you're pretty slick at it. That, that's one end of the, of the spectrum, but there are many uh, practitioners who are only seeing horses occasionally, maybe aren't as up to date with the rules as they should be. Maybe their practice management software isn't as good at, at capturing all, that da all those data. So I think it, there, there, there needs to be a, 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 a sort of constant reminder from the legs of BVA and the BVA um, and other professional associations to remind the members about their, their requirements under the um, horse passport um, rules. Uh, Peter Jones, BVA. Um, I, I think that it's not just butazolidone that is important in this discussion and I, I commend you Keith for saying that the equine vets and the BVA and in fact we've been supporting some efforts now and discussions through the FE in the last few weeks. Um, there's been a, a real problem with availability of medicines in horses for quite some time and one of the things that the Commission has been trying to do is to increase the availability of medicines that don't have an MRL, maximum residue limit and therefore no withdrawal period for horses and many as you know are destined for, for the food chain. So it's worthwhile defending the horse passport system if you want to promote the use of non-MRL medicines in what is a food animal in European law. And I know that equine vets hitherto have been saying, why should we be responsible for signing the horse out in terms of administering medicines when for all other medicines in food animals, it's the farmer that has that responsibility. But for those medicines that the farmer has responsibility for, there is an MRL, there is a withdrawal period on the data sheet or the SPC. For these that have no MRL, there is no such withdrawal period. So I think it's incumbent on the veterinary profession to take that responsibility for signing out very seriously. If you want to retain the use of medicines that have no MRL in increasing the availability of so important medicines in, in, in equine veterinary medicine. And it's not just Butte, there's a whole lot more, as you know, because we're pretty short of approved medicines. In my experience, equine vets have no, no problem accessing medicines of all different types and all different shapes and sizes from every part of the world. So I don't think access to medicines is as big, as, as big an issue as that it's been perhaps made out. So. Tim Morris, Animal Health and Welfare Board for England. I think in discussing this topic, it's important to remember that we're probably dealing with two different routes to the same uh, ideal solution. The first is that the fact remains that across Europe, the horse is a food producing animal. And therefore, just like a sheep, you have to keep ID records, medicines records, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting in the farm livestock community, there is much better compliance because there is cross compliance chessing, uh, there is a market to meet, there are retailers to meet, and the responsibility is taken. But we're left with a situation where the overwhelming um, majority of horses in the United Kingdom aren't in the food chain. And that's whether they're signed out or not, people don't want them into. So I think when we're talking about, so to speak, added extras beyond the very basics of databases and the basics of ID, I think, Keith, you're spot on that those are the responsibility of the industry. And the secret is, is to make the two systems, the governmental EU system and the industry benefit synergistic rather than um, uh, um, antagonistic. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Are there any other questions? 
There's one here and then one over there. Um, I think, thank you, Keith, I, that was really helpful. Um, Lorna Stevenson, AHVLA. One of the issues that we have, and I know many of our um, representatives from the horse charities have, um, is the massive but massive issue of um, unidentified semi-feral ponies and the fly-grazed animals. I mean, we are talking about thousands. This is a major, major welfare issue. Um, I totally agree about the National Equine Database. I think our problem is always, what on earth do we do with unidentified animals? You can up the enforcement all you like, um, and we are very willing to enforce, but if we haven't got an owner that we can link an animal to, then enforcement is actually impossible. So this, this big welfare issue is ongoing. These animals are worthless without microchips, um, but we can't do anything about the supposed owners because we don't know who they are. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's very difficult. And, the, and the, horse, the horse welfare charities only have so much room for these animals. You know, they can't... It's, there's not a limitless supply of horse charities to look after these animals and, gra and grazing for them to live and everything else. I mean, to be brutally honest, these animals, if, they, if, if no owner can be identified, then really there is only one solution. You know, the, that, the, they, they've got to go. You know, they can't, they can't be allowed to just wander around forever. They have to be dealt with. Keith, uh, Keith Meldrum, uh, veterinary advisor to World Horse Welfare. I think we have a marvellous chance in the next few months to try and persuade the Commission to change their proposal for the new passport regulations for horses. Uh, what they have on the table last week, which was in fact not supported by the Standing Committee, is full of holes, and it didn't really take us forward at all on many of the major issues that the veterinary profession and the equine industry wants to see made. Um, for instance, should there not be a system that would allow horses to go back into the food chain under certain conditions after six months? Now, even with phenylbutazone, the levels after some time are very low indeed. Maybe we need to turn that system upside down and say, after six months, will there be any residues at all, the people said, in horse meat? Because there's so many horses that could go into the food chain after six months, be they strays that come from, or fly grazing horses that come from Wales or elsewhere. And we can also try and sort out what's going to happen about notification of death and change of ownership. The present draft does not really address that issue. And we're not going to have a, a database, if we go on like we are, that has any meaningful data on it as to where the horses actually are in life. And I, as a guy that was involved with state veterinary medicine for all my life, think that the equine database has a massive part to play should we ever have a really serious equine exotic disease if we know where the horses might be or in what area they are. There's so much work yet to do. I hope Ben Mays is right that we now have the chance with Beaver, BVA and FEE to try and persuade the Commission to make some substantial changes. Thank you. Yeah, those are really good points. Uh, thanks so much, Keith. I, mean, I, 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 I too think that um, allowing animals to re-enter the food chain would be a good idea. But you have to remember the horses live for a very, very long time. You know, they live for 20 or 30 years and they can enter the food chain at any point during that time. So six months isn't really that long. Um, you could make it a year, you know, and you'd be absolutely sure there'd be no res residues left in that, in, in, in that carcass and still the horse could enter the food chain. So there, 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 are, some, there are some possibilities there. So I support those comments. Um, we're getting near to the end of this session. I'd just like to just draw it back to the question that you are uh, posed, which is, will the passport Im improve horse welfare? And given the, the theme of today, I wonder maybe whether you'd just uh, give us a couple of sentences on, on your view on that uh, for the end of the session. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we've heard about horses being flag raised and, and, um, and um, feral horses, horses with no owners. I mean, the, the, the way to um, um, ensure that horses' welfare is... is is well managed is to ensure that the um, that horses have an owner and, and we're able to trace that owner and we're able to um, um, re record the medicines that that horse has and whether or not it enters enters or, or enters the food chain or not. I do think a horse uh, a, a good horse meat sector is is important for the maintenance of horse welfare across the across the whole of the EU, but particularly in the UK. I mean, at the moment there are, as I understand it, less than ten thousand horses a year go through slaughterhouses in the UK. There's a potential for a lot more, uh, but that will only happen if we've got a robust um, um, horse passport system. Okay, thank you very much indeed.